Happy Sabbath. Let's pray as we begin today. Thank you, Father, for this glorious day and for an opportunity to come and hear more about your wonderful plan to save mankind. We ask that your Holy Spirit would give us eyes that see and ears that hear, Lord, because we ask these things in Christ's worthy name. Amen. John 3.16 is probably the most known, the best known verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave Jesus, that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. That one scripture in itself could be studied for weeks and months. And we're going to look today at whosoever, whosoever believes in him. Let's start this morning in the book of Acts, chapter 10. One of the things that I love about God and has made me just absolutely continue to fall in love with him and, and to want to know more about his amazing plan to save us is the lesson that he teaches Peter in Acts 10, verse 34 and 35. Now, religion is exclusive. Every religion thinks that they are the true ones and have all of the truth. It's, it's the way that religion is. And so Peter's no different. He's been raised in a Jewish heritage, and he, God is having to give him an adjustment. And so he has, you know, the vision about the unclean meat, and then he goes to Cornelius' home, and he has this huge, an amazing epiphany. And he says in verse 34, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. Don't you just love that about God this morning? That is so amazing that God can work through anything. He accepts men from all nations, from every walk of life. No matter what belief system they have, no matter what they've known, God accepts men from every nation who fear him, who have a, a holy respect for him, and who do what is right. You may not realize, but God has equipped every human being to have a relationship with him. That's the next thing. Not only does he accept men any kind, from anywhere who fears him and does what is right, but he has equipped us with everything that we need in order to know the difference between right and wrong. God's given every human being three things. He's given us the power of choice. And sitting here today, you know you have the power of choice. The other thing he's given us is that he has given us a measure of faith. Romans 12 tells us we have been given a measure of faith. We don't just conjure that up on our own. It's a gift. And then number three, the ability to know right from wrong comes from the Holy Spirit. A connection with the Holy Spirit. The still small voice that speaks to us called our conscience. Knowing what is right and what is wrong. That whosoever, anyone over the planet, which totally discounts unconditional election. God is not predetermined in any way, shape, or form who is going to heaven. He has predetermined a plan, and he's made it available to everyone. The truth of the matter is that everyone doesn't want to be part of the plan. There is a difference. God has given every human being the same things. Our response is different because our power to choose is just that. We're very different. But knowing and doing right is a key thing that you and I have to know about clearly. 
And remember, if you want to know the end of the story, you have to know which part? The beginning of the story. So let's go to the beginning of the story in Genesis chapter 4. Because the standard to God is the same. That's one of the things that's so awesome about God is his measuring stick is the same for everyone. You know the story of Cain and Abel. They brought sacrifices before the Lord, and Abel's sacrifice was accepted, and Cain's was not. It is in our nature, because we're carnal, we want for God to accept whatever we give him. We don't want to obey what God tells us to do. Well, mostly we might want to. Sometimes, some. I mean, Cain did bring a sacrifice. He was willing somewhat to bring obedience, but God didn't accept his sacrifice. Number one, we know that in the faith chapter, in Hebrews 11, we're told that Abel offered a better sacrifice because he offered it in faith. Cain did not. Cain brought a sacrifice because it was required. He did not bring it with the right motive. He brought his sacrifice. He brought the wrong sacrifice, and he brought it for the wrong reason. So two X's there. He wanted for God to accept whatever he gave God. And let's see what God tells him. Verse 6. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you but you must master it. Sin is crouching at the door. Sin is crouching at our door all the time. If you look at this door over here, sin is looking underneath to see when you're coming. When are they coming? Sin's crouching at the door, looking. Looking for an opening. When is that door going to open? Just a little bit. Is there any way I can slide underneath? Is there any way I can get in? Sin is crouching at the door wanting to do what? It desires to have you. Sin never gets worn out, never gets tired. It crouches at our door waiting for us to open and let it in. Whatever that wrongdoing is, it's waiting. And what does Jesus tell him? It desires to have you, but you, you must master it. You must overcome it. Cain was unwilling. He was so angry because he did evil and his brother did right. He wanted for God to accept him just because. How is that like us today? We want to hand God whatever we want to give him, and we want him to be okay with it. And we, we want for him to give us the blessings when we don't want to do what's right. Just like Cain. Do you read that Cain was sorry for what he did after he killed his brother? He's not sorry at all. At all. In fact, his entire worry is about his punishment. My punishment is going to be too big. See, that's the part with the carnal nature is that we don't take sin seriously. We don't see the horror of sin. We don't see the price of sin. And when we sin, then we don't want the consequences that come with the sin. Oh, my punishment's too great. I don't want that. He wants to be saved from his punishment. And so that's what I want you to think about as we're studying this morning is do you want salvation or do you want Jesus? What do you want? Do you want just salvation without Jesus? You just want to be saved because you know the other part of John 3.16? The perishing part? You believe that's coming? 
So you want to be saved from that? But what are you being saved to? Most Christians today want salvation for one reason, is because they believe what's coming. They believe that God is true about justice, but they really don't want God. That was Cain's problem. There's no repentance. Let's see what Jesus has to say about that in Luke 5.32. It's like telling God, we want to go to heaven, but we want to do what we want there. We want to go to heaven, but we don't want any rules. We want to go to heaven. Do we really have to spend time around you, Lord? Or can we just, like, go to the beach and go to the mountains when we get there? Wanting God, wanting favor, wanting all that comes with, and thinking that we can get away with that. Look at 531. As we look at John 3, 16, whosoever believes in him, whosoever believes, think about is salvation for everyone? Is the offer of salvation truly for everyone? Yes and no. Yes and no. Look what Jesus says. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So the answer is that salvation is for repentant sinners only. Salvation is for repentant sinners only. Salvation is not for defiant sinners So is is the offer of salvation available? Yes. But if we do not live a life of repentance, then salvation will not be for us. The health is only the healthy. The healthy people don't have any need. If you're feeling great, do you go to the doctor? No. Spiritually, how healthy are you? Spiritually, you should say, I am in great need. I need the great physician every day. I need him to heal me of the disease called sin that I cannot get rid of on my own. You need a doctor, and his name is Jesus. I have not come to call the righteous. The righteous don't need anything. The righteous have everything. He's talking to the Pharisees. They're not in need. There's nothing that Christ can offer them. He says, I have come to call sinners to repentance. The Pharisees are unaware of their illness. It's like having cancer cells growing and growing and not being aware until it's too late. And then we're crying out. That is what sin is. It's a disease like cancer that eats away, eats away until there's nothing left. Go to the next page, John six forty six. I want you to get the importance of hearing the voice and doing what is right because it is the key to responding to the Holy Spirit and living a life of repentance. You and I cannot possibly live a life without sin right now because we are sinful human beings. And God understands that. And he's made a way for us to be cleansed from our sin so that we can keep going and so that guilt 
does not overcome us. So that we are not overcome with shame for our sin. He's made a way, and it's called repentance, and it's a cycle. Those of you that studied the book of Judges, you know that there were seven cycles of apostasy at that time, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. They didn't do what was right according to what God said to do what was right. They did what was right in their own eyes. How are you living your life? Are you living to do what God says is right? Or are you wanting to do your own right and hand it to God and say, you just need to be happy with this. At least it's right because I think it's right. How many times do we want to hand that to God? Oh, my attitude's not that bad. Oh, I wasn't that hateful. Oh, I wasn't that mean. I wasn't that selfish. I wasn't that unkind. I'm not as bad as other people, so just take it, Lord. Just accept it. It's not okay. Repentance means that we turn from that behavior. We turn from that sin. We ask the Holy Spirit to forgive us. There's no forgiveness if we don't call it out, confess our sin. I am sorry for what I did and name what you did. God forgives us. He cleanses us and we move on. And it's gone. And we don't accept false guilt from the devil telling us, oh, look how bad you were. I already know how bad I was, but God has given me a new day. My Lord loves me. I am moving on. I am pressing forward toward the goal. I'm not looking back here except to look at all of my blessings so I can thank God for all he's given me. The life of repentance and doing what is right means that we are willing to make wrongs right every day, all the time. That we're not willing to let even the smallest of things go when the Holy Spirit's speaking to us and saying, that's not okay. You need to make that right. And the Holy Spirit's fanning the flames of conviction, and the devil is standing with a water hose trying to put it out. Oh, it's no big deal. Let's just put that out. Just forget about it. And there's the struggle every day, all the time. Jesus says in 646 here in the book of Luke, Why do you call me Lord and not do what I say? Why are you calling me Lord? To call Jesus Lord is to say that you have a relationship with him. He's saying, why do you call me Lord if you don't do what I say? Whosoever believeth in him, faith has action. Faith equals obedience. Faith is not something intellectual. The demons believe that God exists. They've seen him. They know his power. They know who he is. Will they be saved? Absolutely not. They're lost, awaiting what's coming. Just saying that you know God, coming to church, going through the motions is not enough. Whatever conviction the Holy Spirit's putting on your heart, whatever he is telling you to do, whatever right he is trying to get going in your life, today is the day of salvation. Today is a day to line up so that you do not wind up doing what is right in your own eyes and bringing the same sacrifice that Cain brought and find it to be unacceptable. And it's not just that we can pretend that we know God and we can do all the outside stuff, but it, we are going to a place one day where God will say, I don't know you. But Lord, no, I don't know you. It's not just to know God, but it's to be known by him. It goes both ways. If you will be my people, I will be your God. If you will be mine, I will be yours. If you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. So let's go to the one that talks about right doing, the book of James, right after Hebrews. 
teeny tiny little book that packs a powerful punch. James 4, 17. Anyone then knows the good that he should do and he doesn't do it, sins. Faith is revealed when we do what is right regardless of the circumstances. Faith is revealed when we do what is right regardless of the circumstances. Living by faith costs. If your faith doesn't cost, your faith is worthless. Living by faith means that God is going to ask you to do things. He is going to teach you things about himself that's going to change your life, and you're going to stand radically opposed to the world, possibly radically opposed to family members. Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword to divide. Your worst enemies will be members of your own household. We are marching toward that day. And when that day comes, will you risk? Will you risk being hated by your family to be able to stand with God? You and I are marching every day is closer to that day when God breaks his silence and speaks to all mankind. And are you today allowing God to prepare you? God always prepares us today for what he wants us to do tomorrow. Always. He is awesome beyond in that. If you are listening, he is preparing you. He is showing you. He is molding you. He is refining you one day at a time. Giving you what you need. And Satan stands with crouched position waiting to get you to do what is wrong. And I tell you this because we're going to go to the book of Revelation, Revelation 11. Every now and again we need a very sobering lesson. I saw that, Christopher, every week's that way. (laughs) We need to be sober, self-controlled, alert. We need to be diligent. We need to be vigilant and staying awake so that we're not swept away in the tide that's coming. And I want you to look at what John is John writes the book of Revelation, and this is right after he has the experience that the 144 are going to have. The very next thing he's given, he says, I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count the worshipers there. Count the worshipers there. God intends to measure our actions according to what we know to be right. God is going to measure. In the temple days, the inner court was reserved for the Jewish nation, those that knew God and knew God's ways. The outer court was for the Gentiles. Now, the Gentiles that wanted to get to know God would have to spend time there getting to know God's ways, and eventually they could be adopted in, grafted in. But the inner court is for those that know God's ways. They know him personally. They're walking in his ways. Do you get what John is saying about the inner court and who's going to be judged first? Those that profess to know Jesus right now, you and me, are going to be measured first. Is your faith big enough? Because if faith doesn't equal obedience, it's worthless. And the bottom line is that faith must look, how does that look like? God says, if you love me, you will obey me. Faith expresses itself in love. 
The only thing that counts, Galatians 5 says, it's faith expressing itself in love. What kind of love? Love for God, love for others. It's one complete circle. Faith in God is more than just going to church, reading your Bible. It is about allowing the Spirit to turn you upside down, inside out, to change everything about you that He wants to change one day at a time, and you surrendering to His Lordship. You surrendering to God's authority over your life. As God reveals truth to you, you say, yes, Lord, I will do this. I didn't know this was wrong. Now I know it is. Now I won't do it again. I need for you to empower me so I don't do it again. Is saying, yes, Lord. Because a time is coming where you and I are under persecution. Oh, we can say we have a big faith right now. But what happens when there's a cost to your faith? What happens when you get dragged off to jail or separated from loved ones? Are you willing to stand with the Lord? What we're learning about what the Bible teaches about the time of wrath or the end time is a time of testing. God says it's unequaled. Nothing like this has ever happened before. And horrible things have happened on this planet. Didn't even compare to the flood. Didn't compare to Sodom and Gomorrah. What is coming is going to be horrific because God will be testing the hearts of every human being. And he's starting with us. He's starting with those of us that profess to know him. Will we be willing to pay the price to do what is right? The cost will be very high. And there are many who will, are not willing to let go of stuff and of people. And it'll be more important to be right with people. It'll be more important to be in the, in the right religious system. People won't want to leave their religious system and their church to follow God. But that's happening already. Except that then it's going gonna, it's gonna to be life and death for you and I. And are we ready? Where are you standing with God today? Whosoever will. The offer is for everyone, but not everyone is going to accept it. And I want you to remember that judgment comes to God's house first. Are you ready for the Lord to bring his measuring stick? Now, is God going to judge your righteousness? Absolutely not. There'd be no reason to even get a measuring stick out. If he was going to judge our righteousness, God already knows there's zero. He wants to see your willingness to do what is right and if he will give you his righteousness so that you can enter into eternity forever. When I think about how easy it is for us to be caught up in the distractions of life, how to make the Bible all about just reading, what do I read today? What, what, see, what, how should I spend my time? Instead of truly asking the Holy Spirit to give us humility, first and foremost, so that we can be in the right frame of mind. God is coming to measure your love for him. Wow. He doesn't want you to tell it to him. He's going to give you an opportunity to reveal it to him. God is going to give you an opportunity to reveal your love for him. And persecution is going to refine the inner court. All those that are in the inner court professing to love the Lord, persecution is going to drive out the goats that have just been pretending to go to church and to love God. They've been pretending that God is important to them. But when there's a cost, they're out of there. So in the inner court, you have those that are professing to love Jesus leaving. And then in the outer court, you have Gentiles that have not known God's ways, but that are drawn to God's ways because they, they are really sheep. God has called them, they hear the voice, and they come into the inner court. It is so awesome how God does that with just a test of love. Do you love me more than anything else?